Yeah, I just thought like having like a conversational intro where it like fades in like the volume and the picture like mm -hmm. it's black and and quiet mm -hmm. and it slowly fades in as you're talking. I've never seen that. You've I've never seen that happen. I always thought it'd be like a good that. introduction for a podcast because it kind of eases you in instead of just like pop like you come into it with yeah. no warning for anything. Yeah. No, I, I often find that it's very yeah. some podcasts. It's so just, do you listen to a lot of podcasts? Yeah. How often? Yeah, yeah. Do you listen to them? Like less so now because. I have less time, obviously, mm -hmm. but yeah, like the, in the past four years, I've caught up with uh, mainly, what was I listening to? Uh, Robert Breedlove, Robert Breedlove mm -hmm. and Michael Saylor, like that whole episode series. So you had paid attention to him before BTC Prague. In, yeah, yeah, in, in, in 2020, when yeah. he started, like, when basically Michael Saylor entered the space and he did that podcast series with Breedlove on his, like, w What Is Money show. Uh -huh. And that was the big orange billing for me. That's like, he uh -huh. just, that was just sitting down and listening to that. I, I don't know how long it is, but maybe it's like 20 hours, right? There's like 14 episodes or yeah. something, but he takes it from 20 hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very comprehensive that guy but can talk <laughs> i was just i was just sitting there and i was just i was just taking it in i was yeah. this, this is like yeah and and then i i yeah i listened to like levera what bitcoin did obviously mm -hmm. and went back into like his back catalog and citadel dispatch with matt odell that's that's really good mm -hmm. like, it's usually good good signal and he does that weekly rabbit hole recap with um marty bent as well yeah. i like to follow that but i don't have time necessarily like every week now to to follow everything yeah yeah um, i used to listen to it in a car more often like in, when i lived in america before here that was like a good place for podcasts uh but i i didn't listen to anything crypto related it was all i think some of the big names like the biggest one was called radio lab i don't know if you've heard of that podcast mm -hmm. yeah, they do other kind of uh, neutral titles to where you don't really know what the, the episode is about and then you get into it and it you also don't know what the episode's about for like the first maybe five or ten minutes and it slowly unfolds into a really cool complex intricate story and typically stuff you've never heard about like really interesting stories that are uh, not super popular and then last podcast on the left which was like three funny guys talking about crimes and I think I think that's what it was about it was about horrendous crimes but they're making jokes about it the whole time uh, so very podcasty in that sense. I feel like it's a pretty common form. They were just very good at it, but it's been a while, uh, and now we have we're we're here with our Trezor podcast. Uh, I'm Sean, a Trezor expert and uh, Bitcoin analyst. From what I understand, I didn't realize that was also like an official title of yours. People, people started calling you Bitcoin analyst, and which one? First of all, so this is Lucian. This is my this is my French buddy over here. I'm uh, I'm the American. And there are no other French people here, are there, at our company? Is it just you? No, there are. There Ooh. are. But Secret uh, French I, I don't people? know if they're comfortable just... They haven't disclosed their identity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we won't reveal it on the podcast. No, there, there's, I think there's, uh, there's at least one other. And, uh -huh. But I think there's a couple. Um, there's at least a couple of us. And then maybe another person. I can't remember. There's a lot of French-speaking people, though. Yeah, yeah. That just makes it even harder to... That makes it easier to blend in, actually. <laughs> easier easier to hide if you're one of the natives. We have too many Americans now. I, I thought it was there were only like three or four of them whenever I started, and now we've got like 10, 11. And I recruited one, so I, I'm part of the problem, actually, which is the most, I think, American thing I can be. So <laughs> I think that's, that's a perfect illustration of being an American. Um, but yeah, do you consider yourself more Trezor expert or more Bitcoin analyst? Is there a ratio that you have in your head? I'm not sure if there's a ratio and the two sort of... Are you exactly 50-50? I Exactly. It's 50% expert, 50% mm -hmm. analyst, just, just right there. And what I try to keep a very sort of pure 50-50 uh -huh. ratio about <laughs> it. Yeah, for sure. What about emotionally? Do you, do you lean towards one or the other? I'm assuming 50-50 is like your actual job, but... It, it depends. Sometimes... Is your, is your heart in one more than it is the other? <laughs> sometimes it's just expertise in the morning uh -huh. and a little bit of analysis in the afternoon. Yeah. You never know. You never you know. You wind down with a little bit of analysis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the evening sometimes. And what do what do experts do? We can... If, if anyone missed the first podcast, which I'm sure plenty of people will have because this is a brand new thing that we're doing. Uh, how would you describe the Trezor Expert service for anyone who doesn't know? Yeah, so Trezor Expert is basically designed uh, onboarding newcomers to 
the crypto and self-custody space. Mm -hmm. So um, it's basically an onboarding, uh, sort of concierge style onboarding. So it's a one hour, one-on-one -on -one webcam session, and which is secure and privacy respecting. And basically we use that hour to create a new wallet mm -hmm. for you and make sure that everything uh, works properly, make sure that your backup is correct and answer any questions you might have and, and, and make sure you know basically what you're dealing with and how to stay safe and how to manage your assets uh, securely. So we've got that one hour session and then we do a little bit of follow up uh, just to make sure everything's working out for you. So if you've got any extra questions, uh, we don't just leave you alone after the session. You can just uh, follow up and, and, and just keep asking questions. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good service. I did a few of the uh, test runs before we like fully rolled everything out. And I was really, I was expecting quality, but I was, I was still, I think, surprised or caught off guard a bit by just how much the people that I worked with knew. Um, I already had Bitcoin knowledge or crypto knowledge going into it, um, but there was stuff that I was learning even after years of being in the space. Uh, so I was like, this is really solid. It's given me more confidence about it whenever I speak to people about it. Um, so thank you for that. Our topic today is uh, how to stay resilient against phishing and scams, uh, both, I would say, <clears throat> on the internet and in crypto. Obviously, a focus on crypto, but this is a problem all over the internet. And uh, just to kick us off with the most the most broad question possible, uh, what is phishing? It's I don't know if you have a definition or or just specific examples, but how would you describe it? So, phishing is it's a type of cyber attack and it's a type of social engineering attack where basically someone's going to try to make you react in a certain way and have you. Uh, reveal information, for example, that you wouldn't want to reveal, or for example, send money. And so to do that, they're going to play on, um, they're going to play on trust, mm -hmm. and they're going to play on your emotions, basically, to, to, to make you react to something. So for example, um, you might receive a an email from your bank, from exam for example. So it, 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 at least mm -hmm. it looks like it's from your bank. So you see that email, and it looks important, it looks urgent, and it looks official, and it says um, we've identified a problem or like a, um, a suspicious connection to your account or something. So you need to mm -hmm. click there, log in, and change your password, for example. So then you, you, you look at that and you might think something's going wrong, I need to take action, and it looks realistic enough, so you'll just click on that link and it takes you to a website, and then there's a box in that website to log in. So you'll type your um, your login and your password. And then it turns out that this website is fake and it's run by um, the attacker. Mm -hmm. So that allows them to harvest your login and your password, or it could be sort of any type of, of information. And then they're able to um, either, I don't know, steal your identity or steal money from you. or So it's that sort of attack where so it plays on on trust mm -hmm. because you trust your bank or you trust official institutions and so they make it look realistic enough so you're going to have trust in uh, the message that you're receiving and then it plays into um into your emotions into fear and greed so uh for example you've got you're concerned that your account might be shut down um, so you're going to take action or maybe someone's offering you uh, something for a limited time or offering you free money uh, if you send a little bit of money or something like that. And so now it taps into uh, into the, the, the greed and the FOMO and yeah, and, yeah, and, and it's concerning because a, a, quite a few people can fall for it because if it looks realistic enough and it's at the right time in the right place in the right circumstances you'll see that and you'll react to it and it's just really easy sometimes to just go down the path and and get tricked yeah um <clears throat> and some of what you said i realized uh you said at the beginning like you know basically tricking someone into either giving up uh, sensitive information or somehow stealing it and i realized as we were prepping just or once we decided on the topic for this podcast i kind of had uh 
a specific idea in, in my head of what it was or a bias, I guess, in my own brain. I, I kind of just, when I think phishing, I think link. I think false link that you click and it's malicious either runs code or uh, compromises some sort of uh, information on your computer. But the the root idea is just giving up sensitive information, really, because uh, that could also be like a phone call. People get calls of, uh, we, everyone's heard a story about like an older person being targeted, like maybe someone who's more vulnerable or uh, less familiar with these things going around, um, or just a fake website. Uh, it doesn't have to be a link. It could be a website, like you said, um, and examples like that. Uh, has it ever happened to you? At any point, or is, is there any any situation you've been in where you encountered this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I receive, uh, I, I've received, you know, the classic. I think emails that mm -hmm. everyone receives. Everyone's seen the wide net stuff. It's very, it's a, a very very wide net. So, for example, I don't have a PayPal account, and in my spam folder, I constantly have some fake PayPal emails trying to get me I, I, yeah. I don't even know what it's about because I don't really pay attention to it yeah or you know sometimes you'll receive an SMS and it says um oh you've got a parcel and it's like well I, I didn't order anything but if you did at that point so then maybe it would be more effective um and then I'm on you know Bitcoin um crypto forums reddit things like that mm -hmm. so people will go into your dms and start messaging you and in general you, yeah. you just know that it's some type of person just approaching you with some idea in mind that they're going to try and, and, and scam you out of money so all of these and for me that they're quite easy to um to ignore but you, you sort of constantly get exposed to that mm -hmm. i think something that happened to me but i don't know if, if that's exactly phishing but it's definitely some type of attack or scam it's um i had one of these um fake um card terminals so i think i was at a uh -huh. gas station a yep. few years ago and you you put your card in and, and you type the pin code and everything's going well you know you take gas in and the money gets out of the account mm -hmm. but a few weeks later i had basically my account my bank account being like completely drained by uh, online purchases that I, I didn't make uh -huh. and so they successfully got the information yeah yeah uh -huh. for sure uh i think they just clone the card yeah. and then when you do that i don't e even think you need the pin but then they have the pin as well because you type it on the uh -huh. on the on the keyboard so i just um i just basically had to call the bank and and thankfully so you you have to do a little bit of admin around it you have to say you have to contest mm -hmm. uh, the purchases and that but I mean in the banking world the bank was able to to just um, to just reverse the transaction uh, and, yeah. and and refund so it wasn't um, yeah it, it, it wasn't that bad but definitely it's something that can happen when it happens you see your bank account like that you could it, it's it's oh, it's going on <laughs> yeah yeah it's not nice it's concerning and you, you feel like like something's been so something's obviously wrong yeah mm -hmm. it doesn't where did that happen to you? Was that somewhere over here? Uh, no, it, it, it was back in France, actually, back um, uh -huh. back in the days a few. Yeah, there few was years a ago. a period where that was like a really it very quickly became a popular method. I don't know if it is now, but it was maybe it was overblown, but it was all over Reddit because uh, they were attaching. They call them skimmers, and they it's like a, a false cover that goes over the top and it just scans all your card information and comes out. Mm. Apparently that's why they say, I still do this just out of habit. They say to jiggle it before you put your card in because it's typically not very well secured physically and it'll just pop off if you do something like that. And they can put them on the uh, terminals too, like in a gas station. Uh, it's just a cover that goes over and uh, whenever you put it in, it takes all the info. Mm. So yeah, that same thing I know for sure was in the United States as well. And that, that that gets me a little bit paranoid actually now because there's there's yeah. so many of these different like plastic sort of keyboard pin things and yeah. you go like sometimes you go like this is this is fake for sure. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like for us, like you know, we're on the internet, we're on Reddit, these different places where you might be informed. Um, like a lot of people aren't, and so you're almost defenseless against it. You're not even thinking. Like before that, I mindlessly put in my card for everything. There's no reason, it, I guess, until now that you wouldn't. Because uh, it's not something that I ever suspected at any point. But so many people, if you're not informed about these things, there's no way to set up a defense against them in the first place. And that that kind of leads to the next question is like, why why should we care, particularly in the crypto space versus uh, these other more general environments? I think most people at this point are familiar with 
um, they're familiar with like links, with websites, with phone calls, stuff like that. Uh, but in the crypto space, it is different. It's not just the fact that things can be taken, but the consequences. Um, but yeah, why should people care in this space versus others? Yeah, so, so for example, in my previous story, the bank was happy to just look at the transactions, determine that it wasn't me making them, and then I guess they were able to um, have some sort of insurance or just reverse them and then, then refund me the money. But in the uh, crypto space, this is never going to happen. Um, when the crypto is gone, it's just gone. So it's more like someone stealing, uh, for example, a piece of cash or some gold from you in the sense that if it's gone, you can't really just make it reappear like that. If it's, if it's gone, it's gone. So this is why it, this is concerning for crypto users because, um, because due to that, scammers are more likely to um, want to target crypto users because they're able to just steal something that that no one can that that basically they can just run away with, mm -hmm. and so in in a sense, if you're in crypto and in self custody, it becomes easy to protect yourself because you're not exposed to a third party making a mistake on your behalf or someone stealing some login and then and then and then going and logging into an account and and stealing funds from you yeah. you're in control of your private keys the problem is if someone tricks you into revealing those private keys or, or sending the money out of uh, your wallet then in that case there's really nothing yeah, that, that can be done that's the last step there <laughs> yeah and 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 with a lot of people these days going uh, into self custody um, scammers are really trying to um, take advantage of that of of um, people being misinformed and yeah so that it's been it's been a concern yeah that is why i mean it is important to learn before you dive into the space that's exactly why we're doing podcasts like this just to get people more informed uh and spread information uh outside of just what is now the 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 crypto community uh, which is it's getting more and more popular getting bigger every single year and I, I did encounter that recently, actually. Uh, my case was I just wanted to get to their customer service. And something, this may not be 100% accurate. I want to say that up front. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened. But something suggested that I contact customer support on Telegram. And I thought that was like a little bit weird, like going to a third-party app. Telegram is a communication uh, app for anyone who doesn't know, a messaging app. And I, looked, I just looked up KuCoin customer service. There were two listings. One of them was misspelled. So I'm like, okay, that's definitely a scam. Let's check out the other one. I was like, this still could be. It just says anyone can make a label out of something. I was like, what are the standards here? And this guy messaged me for days. Um, I thought it was, well, I didn't, again, I was treading cautiously, but this this person kept responding over several days. It wasn't like instant feedback. I'd send a message. They would message back hours later. Uh, I was trying to I wanted to get my problem solved and I didn't know where else to go. So I was like, let's see if this works. And long story short, we got to the end and he's like, okay, to activate your account, you just need to send, it was, he called it, I think it was rectification was the word he used, which is not a word I'd heard before or was familiar with. And I like, I looked it up. I think this is a part of it. They like try to confuse you. So and already like you were confused stuff. by that yeah, word. Now. Yeah. I, it's like, <laughs> oh, a rectification account. I'm like, okay. Yeah, like that's what they're wanting people to do. And uh, I, he posted the address as a Bitcoin wallet. And I'm like, okay, so this is a scam. As soon as I send it here, this guy disappears. He takes the money. Most people wouldn't, like, they would at least get confused, I think, if you're not familiar with how things work on a technical level. Uh, that's kind of why there's, I don't want to take us too far off the topic, but that's why I like stuff with like exchanges, which we recommend getting off. That's why people go there is the convenience and the ease of doing everything. You don't deal with, uh, addresses as much or private keys and that you do but it's it's like the safety padding is put mm -hmm. on them so when you encounter something like that you see a long string of characters hey just send this in that can be very confusing to people and that's why the education matters in the first place the consequences are bigger if you the security is higher which is the advantage that's what we uh, kind of get behind that's why we like uh, our hardware wallets at trezor and why we advertise self-custody so heavily but that also brings responsibility with it. You need to know what you're doing um, at, as uh, a part of the security that you get with cryptocurrency. Yeah. But yeah, those are, I mean, yeah, both good examples from you as well. 
Uh, we can talk about some other things too, um, such as like some of the common mistakes people make. This is also like a little bit related since we're talking about problems that people have. We can start with like safe storage. Uh, this is a topic that comes up a lot because we'll say very quickly if you're if you're new here, most people are probably going to be familiar with this. But if you don't know, uh, whenever you create a wallet using a Trezor device, you're given private keys. And those keys are a series of words that correlate with, uh, I believe it's hexadecimal, creates a very long hexadecimal string, but each letter correlates with it inside of the private key. And those give immediate access to your funds if anyone finds them. If anyone finds the 20 words, uh, the money is there, theirs. Uh, they can just take it. So it's, it's very sensitive, but it's also extremely secure. It can't be cracked. It can't be broken. It can't be brute forced. So that's the advantage of having one. And the question comes up, how do I safely store these private keys or these backups, as we call them. We call them the backup, the 20 words, or it can be 12, 24 words of different standards. Um, what do you have to say about that in terms of safe storage or how to handle your private key or backup? Mm -hmm. there is, so there's different backup standards. You might have mm -hmm. a list of words that's uh, 12 words, 24 words. And um, these days we use 20 now as the, as the standard. But they, they, standard, yeah. They, they, they all roughly do the same thing. They represent, as you said, that, that sort of very long password, that's sort of the private key of your wallet, and that will represent all your funds. So if you get locked out or if you um, if your device, for example, has a problem, a malfunction, you can take that list of words and put it into a new wallet and just completely recreate the wallet. So it's, it's very powerful, mm -hmm. but anyone who has that list of words can also recreate the wallet. So... Um, as you said, there comes the, the challenge of just um, securing it and basically making sure that no one is able to get to it. So the first thing you want to do is always keep it completely offline. Um, and so when you write it down, usually your um, hardware wallet and the app will give you those instructions sort of um, that's the first rule is don't take any pictures of it with your phone. Don't go and put it in your emails or your notes or even a secure password manager because once it, that information sort of touches that online connected computer smartphone world, then you don't really know what happens with the information. Maybe it gets leaked or you, mm -hmm. you, you, you're you not quite sure. So to keep safe, you only want that information to be just from the hardware wallet to just pen and paper and yeah. only ever write it down on uh, on paper or at least on an offline um, sort of medium. So there's also some metal solutions that you can use, but never on, on a computer or a phone or anything like that. And then at home, you just want to make sure that you're going to be able to access that information when you need it, but that no one, uh, no unauthorized person basically is going to be able to find it. So that might mean different things to different people, depending on uh, depending on where you live and who you can trust and the people you live with. And um, if you live, for example, in, in an apartment in a city, in a studio apartment, or if you live in a big uh, sort of house, in the countryside, you've got many different, um, you're facing a different situation basically to, to hide that, um, that wallet backup. But in general, what we say, we can't be too specific, obviously, because then we'd be giving uh, people ideas. Yeah. But um, the idea is that you want to put that wallet backup, that list of words somewhere where you would keep some valuables, basically. So you, you just think of it as a bar of gold, basically, yep. because it is literally uh, the money. If someone gets it, they can just run away with the money and there's nothing you can do about it. So we say the analogy is, well, if you have a safe at home, this is definitely like a place where mm -hmm. it would belong. Or maybe if you've got some uh, precious documents that you're hiding somewhere. or And then it's up to you to be creative where you want to hide that information and I've mentioned uh, metal uh, mediums for backing up your recovery um, wallet backup as well so that can give you more options as well to hide it so for example if you're in a house and you've got your wallet backup on metal maybe you can hide it somewhere a bit more creative I don't know outside or yep. in the garden shed or something like that or buried somewhere I don't know and on the other end 
the piece of paper th is a, isn't that sturdy, but then it's it's more discreet as well because it's just that small piece of paper that that also gives you a lot of options. Mm -hmm. And what you have to make sure as well is don't be so creative that you won't know what you did with it, and yeah. and, and you won't be able to find and treat it. Treat it with respect. Yeah, and 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 usually actually that scenario can be more likely than than someone uh, finding it at home and and stealing your funds. What what we see sometimes is people trying to hide it and actually locking themselves out because then they can't uh, retrieve yeah. that information basically. And yeah, just to touch on that real quick, like there's a lot of criticisms people bring up about that from the beginning. You address one of them, which is uh, physical destruction, uh, which we, we have solutions for basically all of these things. Uh, we can't go deep or won't go deep into them right now. Uh, just so we don't lose too much focus. But yeah, metal will back up physical destruction for anything. And then you can also split your private key into multiple pieces as well. Because um, the first thing I feel like if someone who's unfamiliar with the podcast is, is listening or unfamiliar with crypto it is then listening to this podcast, they're like, oh, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? It's like, yeah, we thought of those things. Um, the metal is a way of preventing it from fires, from water damage, uh, from impact, stuff like that. And then it's much harder to lose as well. Yeah, to, to yeah. misplace because it's that heavy, hefty sort of piece of metal. And then splitting it up, you can do X out of X, like 5 out of 10, 7 out of 11, 3 out of 5, mm. uh, however many you want to recover a wallet so that there's no single point of failure for things as well. And but people just don't even know that that exists That that's because that's a, a pretty heavy criticism people bring up a lot of the time. Yeah, but so that's with the new backup standard. So you, you start yeah, maybe 20 words. Just zoom in quickly on that. So you start with 20 words and then you can just upgrade at any time without creating a new wallet. Mm -hmm. And you can just, for example, decide that you want to have um, three lists of words and mm -hmm. you'll need two to recover the wallet. So the idea behind it is that, for example, now I can keep someone, uh, I can keep one piece um, of the three piece. I can have one at home, one at the office and one, for example, at a friend's or family member that I trust. And so now if you steal the one that's at home, you need a second piece. But if my friend loses their copy, then I still have my two copies and it's two out of three. So it gives me some redundancy and it protects me from someone stealing uh, my list of words and just being able to run away with the money. So it's, yeah. it's very powerful. But broadly speaking, like some of the stuff you said, like hide things, that's one for sure. Like hiding is definitely one of the best ways to do it, particularly if you can split things up. Uh, sharing it, I do think is good, but that's with the caveat of make sure you trust who you're sharing it with. So if you're going to share it with a family member or a friend, you are giving them access. That's the thing that people need to realize and comprehend uh, is probably the best word. Like that person has access to either that exact wallet, if it's one share or a piece of the share, uh, if they've been given one. Um, and then there's just be discreet, like don't advertise the fact that you're holding a bunch of Bitcoin or that you've got something somewhere or hiding somewhere, like be subtle. There's no reason to brag or to advertise, hey, there's a big pile of money that you can access if you can find it. Like I got a bunch just sitting somewhere and good luck. Like yeah. that's probably not a good idea. Absolutely. You, you wouldn't just go out and go like, oh, I have a million dollars worth of gold yeah. in my house. Cause keep, you it, keep it secret. <laughs> Is there any way to report it if, if like something happens to you? Is there any any sort of defense mechanism against phishing or scams? <laughs> um, well, we always say if if you see like a fake app, so for example, or if you're contacted by a fake support agent, mm -hmm. it's always good to report it to. Uh, for example, if it's a fake Coinbase support agent, you, you I, I'd go on Coinbase and and report it or if there's a fake app. So if you see, if you're trying to access Trezor Suite, for example, on um, on Google and, and you see a fake website that's inserting itself there mm -hmm. and you should be able to tell because the URL will, will not be correct. It will be misspelled or it will be something else. Mm -hmm. And so we um, appreciate if, if these are reported. So that's, I think that's the, the best way is to mm -hmm. just ignore it and 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 maybe if you feel like it, yeah, it's helpful to report it because then it allows us to uh, investigate and to uh, have that website taken down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I actually was going to say that as well and I forgot, but yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to bring up. Um, the reporting helps with 
defense in the future. Uh, even if you if you evade something entirely or if you fall victim to it, like the fact that we know what is going on and we're able to kind of deduce information from it that helps us defend against it in the future and then warn others, which is literally what we've done. That's like exactly what has happened with scams. It's how you learn about them and how you find out. Uh, but and another, I think, important nuance with all of it. I mean, my and by the way, my answer is basically like be proactive. Like we we already talked about how uh, once you've sent it, it's gone. So as long as you are not typing in an address and sending your crypto somewhere, you should be good. Um, or as long as you're not giving up your uh, recovery seed or your your backup, like that's that's why we say put it in analog because that thing can't be fished. If you write it down on a piece of paper, uh, it's not getting fished off the internet. So you you can have even if it does happen to you, like your information can be taken, your name, your address, your email, your phone number. Those are the typical ones. Uh, that doesn't compromise your cryptocurrency. It's yeah, if yeah. you have it on, I mean, maybe if you're holding it on an exchange, like that could possibly happen because they could get into your account. That's why we recommend getting off of exchanges and putting them onto a wallet. Your wallet can't be hacked. So as long as you are not actually typing something in and sending it, it's not going to happen to you. Yeah. So if, you, if you're if you in self-custody with a hardware wallet, literally um, you're not exposed to any of these sort of online attacks, malware, you can use those devices with a completely compromised computer. They're um, designed that way to, to be secure, even in uh, unsafe environments. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to steal money from you when you're in self-custody with a hardware wallet, they literally have to ask you, basically. Mm -hmm. So they, they can be a bit uh, smart and tricky about it, but yeah. they do, at the end of the day, have to ask you either to send the money to an address or to ask you for the wallet backup for the, that list of words that recovers your wallet. And then if they've got that, they can have your money as well. So these are the two main ways um, that they're, they're going to be able to steal money from you. Yeah, Either uh, tricking you into sending money to an address or tricking you into entering the um, wallet backup. So, and what we see a lot of, uh, so attacks specific to self-custody crypto users. So you might see, uh, for example, some emails uh, that you receive and it might say uh, there's an update on that blockchain, for example. Uh, so if you don't do something, uh, your coins might be lost, they might be at risk. So you need to, uh, so then you need to click on that link or something like that and it will take you to some website and then it will say, okay, so in order to update your blockchain status or whatever technical jargon that they're going to use to confuse you. Yeah. Uh, please enter your um, recovery seed words or your wallet backup. And and then, so you, you might, then again, it plays on that urgency, right? You don't want to lose your funds. You're confused and you don't know what to do. And that website says that it's going to help you. It's going to fix it. So you just, in that moment, you're just a little bit panicked and, yeah. and you're going to, um, just just gave in and and enter the words on the computer. There's um, those threats that play on greed as well that that you see a lot. That um, so it's um, free. I'll send you a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin if you send a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. Yeah, that uh, is a really common one. They start with send something first and then you'll get more back mm -hmm, because of some mm -hmm. promotion or yeah. it's like the, the first offering of a new company or something like that. Uh -huh. I've, yeah. I've heard a really crazy one actually. Uh, a couple of days ago, I had uh, this friend on the phone and so he's on all sorts of Discord channels and things and crypto signals, um, telegram groups and things like that. And so sort of, crypto investment advisor sort of that that, that 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 kind of world right and so he was um going to that discord that was i i don't know saved in his previous visits or something like that but he couldn't remember where he found it basically but he started um basically connecting to this app and it was some sort of portfolio managing app basically so the idea is that it's it's a wallet and they'll manage the money for you and they promise you like a some return right so they'll just make investments for you and and you'll get more money uh coming out of there and so he started using that i guess thinking he's used it before or something like that and and sending money to it and then after a while i i, I guess 
something felt quite off about it. So he started questioning it and, and realized that he might have made a mistake. And so now, um, yeah, so he, he tried to initiate basically a withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And so the um, wallet or app or, 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 or whatever basically said, oh, okay, it's, it's pending right now because of high Just fees. No. So we can't get you the money back. Yeah. <laughs> so then he was like, oh, okay. So he knew now he realized his mistake. And, and that, that's such a crazy story because what he did is that he actually contacted the um, scammer on Telegram and he gave him that story like, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I like your app, your wallet, you know, I've been playing with it with like pocket money right now. I want, I want to see if it works. So I've sent, I think it was something like $500 worth of Bitcoin. So, oh, I've sent that. I want to know, I, I want to see if I can get it back basically before I send more, mm -hmm. right? And the, and the guy actually let him have the money back. He, he returned it? He returned the money. <laughs> and I think he, he told me there's even like a little bit of money on top of that. Yeah. So he, he managed to make money. Wow, that's a bold of, scammer. But this is not all cases. Usually, That's what you can do if you a, fall victim. It's yeah. a very, very crazy I, story because usually it doesn't end like that. that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't usually end like that. You don't you don't usually see the money back when you do that. addicted to risk, whoever this <laughs> scam artist was. Yeah, so that that's more evolved and that sort of gets into these uh telegram support yeah. agents or telegram groups or you that can you, get a little seedy sometimes you, you have to be wary of basically it's our everything. second telegram story on this podcast yeah. so far yeah yeah, yeah. and so th th be, that's why be careful guys if you're on there and that's why i don't think it's very good to have uh support even your legit support yep. on, on on telegram because then yeah, that's just asking for imitators and scams yeah, exactly. And, stuff and like that. people might be looking for your legit support and be approached yeah. by complete strangers just because they imitate your name and your logo on Telegram. It's really easy to do. And but yeah, so you've got those. You've got um, free NFTs. If you click yeah, yeah. that link and enter your um, recovery, your wallet backup, or sometimes well, more address poisoning too. Yeah, address, drops. address poisoning is huge. So address poisoning is when you, for example, you're in a situation where you're sending money to an exchange. Mm -hmm. And so you'll send money to that address, which is a legit address. And then right after that, basically robots scan the blockchain and they see that transaction that you've made and they're going to craft an address that looks a lot like the address you've used basically so the the first the beginning and the end of the address yep. is going to look very similar and and then they're able to basically insert a transaction that looks like the transaction you've made mm -hmm. and it was maybe like 30 seconds later or a minute later and and they make it look like it was to that fake address basically that they own but that yeah. looks like your exchange address the idea is that the next time you want to send to that exchange maybe a week later mm -hmm. you're gonna go oh i've sent to coinbase last week right so yeah. instead of going to coinbase and get my address my deposit address i'm just gonna go to my transaction history and and I'm going to copy it from there and I'm going to use that because I know it's my Coinbase yeah. address. And actually it looks, I know what it looks like as well. Yeah. And so you check maybe the beginning and it, it starts the same. A lot of apps will cut out the middle as well. So you only yeah. see the beginning and the end. You yeah, know, yeah. And like know what's in the, in the center. Yeah. So, so, so you go and you go in your transaction history and you use that address, you copy and paste it. And, and then you send money thinking you're sending to your exchange or sending to another of your trusted wallets. Mm -hmm. And you're actually sending to uh, the scammer's address yeah. and that that can happen uh, quite a bit so this is why we always say never go in the transaction history to pick up an address from there it's not a safe uh, source for your address so if, if you're receiving to your to your own wallet uh, you need to click the receive button and 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 get the address from there. Mm -hmm. And every time you're trying to send to your exchange, even if you've done it before and it's in your transaction history, every time you want to go uh, to your exchange and get the address from there, even if it's just to make sure that, uh, for example, the address might change or and, and yep. it might not be valid anymore, or just to double check basically and sanity check that you're, you're not just 
using the wrong address basically you yep. want to always have um get it from the from the trusted source and one thing i might point out here because we're talking about just all these bad things that can happen to you in the crypto space uh, a lot of these things are solved and avoidable just by good practices um, most of these prey on either feelings or bad habits um, following good habits will keep you perfectly fine. Like the, the address poisoning you just mentioned, that's counting on the fact, it's like preying on people's laziness. It's counting on them going back into their transaction history and thinking, oh, this is my, the same wallet, and then throwing it into a new transaction when what you should be doing is getting it off of uh, the website itself or from, with, I mean, with Trezor, you can generate a fresh address every time. That's another practice that we recommend is like every time you do something, get a new address and send it there. If you're doing that every time, you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. So, And then you can verify it on the screen of the device as well. Like mm -hmm. those things are uh, good practices that they might sound confusing if you've never done it before, but it's very simple once you get used to it. It's just a, a new way of doing things with sending digital currency. Mm -hmm. But it's quite simple to do, and that's why we've implemented these things. Yeah, and so... Every blockchain is different. So with Bitcoin, you can select a new address yeah. every time. And yeah, I was and referring specifically to Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. So and and, and you should because it will improve uh, your privacy as well down the line. So that yeah. that's that's always good. Um, then Ethereum and um, similar sort of account based cryptos like that, you always use the same address because you've got your, uh, for example, your Ethereum and your tokens are under the same address, and you need some Ethereum to pay the fees. So then you've got that. Uh, that one address basically that is more like an account number and it's more akin to uh, to an account but and, and yeah as you said uh, it can prey on 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 laziness or bad habits just mm -hmm. going to transaction history because you think it's simpler also uh, what we see is that it can prey on cautiousness as well so we've got um, for example you're a user and you want to send a large amount of money to your coinbase account and so what you're going to do is you're going to send a little bit first. So you're going to go to Coinbase and you're going to get the address from there. So totally legit address. Yeah. And you're going to send um, you're going to send 0 0.1 ETH just to make like a test transaction to see if yeah. it actually gets there. So you do That's that. That's me. And I do that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> just and to be positive before I keep going. Yeah, absolutely. And so then you've got you see the money being credited to your account and you go like, OK, everything checks out. So now I can send hundred thousand dollars there right mm -hmm. but so you want to make sure you use the same address so what are you going to do maybe you're going to go to transaction history mm -hmm. and you're going to pick up that last address that was used because um because it's for you it's it's obviously the same address that's why you made the test transaction right mm -hmm. but in the meantime the scammer was able to swoop in and send you that transaction because they can see the transaction you just made to coinbase Wow. So then they're able to swoop in like a minute later and send you that fake address. So then if the next thing you do is go back to transaction history, once you see the transaction has been confirmed mm -hmm. and you pick up that address and now it's fake and now they've yeah. got you and now you send. So in that small uh -huh. window of time. Yeah. And we see that happen um, happen a lot. So making test transactions like that is is good and it's a good sanity check as well. But that's as far as you actually go to Coinbase a second time and you get that address a second time. If you want to make sure that you're not making a mistake, the best thing that you can do is at the moment that you send, always you get that visual confirmation basically. So you go to your Coinbase account on one side and you look at the Trezor device's trusted screen on the yeah. other side and you just double check, okay, this is my Coinbase address. Okay, this is where I'm sending to, yeah. and you just double check that every character matches, then you sign the transaction. If you do that in theory, you don't even have to do a test transaction, but um, that's just a peace of mind thing. But yeah. test transactions are good as long as you get the address from the correct place the second time as well, and not from the transaction history. See, Trezor expert. This is what you get if you, <laughs> if you sign up for the service right here. Plenty of rich information. Um, but yeah, going back to some of the, I wanted to touch on that too, what you were saying earlier, just some of the signs, either I guess warning signs or red flags um, of phishing. How do you see that coming or, or what are some th some signals that something's, something's afoot, uh -huh. something's fishy? Well, <laughs> if someone's offering me free money 
Yeah. Or free things. That's a good one. In general, yeah. That, it's, that, that should be the first red flag because that, that doesn't usually happen. Uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it, mm -hmm. probably, it probably is. And that's valid for like all, all types of scam, right? Then what you might want to look out for in an email is obviously the address of the sender. But that's not always, that doesn't always cut it, right? Because... Mm -hmm. um, maybe maybe the sender has been compromised. So maybe it's actually from them, but they're being controlled by someone else now. So you, you can never really uh, be sure. If you're on a website, you might want to check that. You know, the first red flag is if there's some obvious like spelling mistakes, if things don't look right, the logo might look a bit funny, the address looks wrong. Um, what you can do when you're on a website is in the address bar, obviously check if you're on um, for example, if you're trying to visit the Trezor website, it should say trezor.io. Mm -hmm. And so you just you can just check the website URL. Also, it should say HTTPS at the beginning. Yeah. And then uh, a lot of people don't know about that. Yeah. So that that's always something that you can check as well. And then um, you might be able in your browser, so still in the address bar, usually it's on the left, you'll have like um, like a little settings bar or a little padlock and that will give you information about the certificate so that will tell you basically from a trusted angle if if the website is legit or not what most web browsers will do as well is completely sort of filter out these fake websites so you don't even have to interact with them but yeah so to go back to these red flags so these are some of the uh red flags basically or in general people approaching you like that or or telling you that uh, something needs an action on your part basically you can identify some of those red flags but the thing is you can't always sometimes it's going to look completely legit and sometimes it might even come actually from the trusted source and the trusted source has been compromised so basically yeah. the the only thing that you can do is trust nothing and always assume that it's been compromised. And so if something requires an action on your part, the best thing you can do is to just stop and think and don't do anything straight away and try to confirm. Uh, so for example, if it's your bank, try to call the number basically of your bank, try to speak to the person you usually speak to, or try to get that confirmation that it's actually legit and, and there's actually something that, that you need to do. And then if it's crypto, it's really simple. I mean, you shouldn't be uh, sending money like that. To yeah. um, that, that's obviously something that that should be a red flag. And then, if anything asks you to enter the wallet backup, to enter the recovery seed phrase, that's that's always that's always a no go. You you should yeah. never enter it anywhere. You should never enter it on the computer or in any apps like that. Um, so that that should be that should be the red flag basically for anything because if you remember that then you can't get tricked ever yeah i was gonna say interacting with someone at all uh, online concerning crypto is a is a situation where you should always be alert there's so many well there's there's not a lot of situations where that's even necessary in the first place like most of it you can just do yourself or interacting with a website but um, if you're dealing with someone, it's just like be a little cautious. Mm. Um, and one thing that people, I, I'm seeing this talked about more, but everyone's used to the the big broad phishing attack or or scam artist, where you, everyone's gotten like the ridiculous email, uh, like the the classic one is like the the Nigerian prince email from like how, how old is that? It's like the 90s. Things when that happened, I don't know when that originated, but like everyone has heard about that. I think it's the yeah, like late two thousand meme. Yeah, yeah, and but <laughs> it was a real thing. But like these days, a lot of the phishing techniques, the way the way it works is they're getting more specific, uh, but they require more time investment. Mm -hmm. Like the the most recent thing that I've heard of is like someone being emailed for weeks about like setting up a meeting. This, ha this has happened to companies and, and whole like corporations have been compromised over things, but they will sit there and, and talk to you for a long time, build and develop a relationship, have a whole background profile. They'll have like Twitter followers or a, a filled out LinkedIn. English is perfect, like no signs there. But what they'll do is you set up a meeting with them. This is the most common one I've heard. 
they'll send, you'll send them a link for the meeting. And when the time comes, they don't show up and like, oh, I'm sorry, we got cut up and things. It'll happen maybe once or twice. Eventually they'll send you a link and that's where they're trying to catch you. The whole thing, it's like the long game. And they've typically specified it to your identity, your personality. It, it looks like someone you're supposed to be interacting with. And that's where they'll try to get you. You'll click on the meeting link and that's where the compromise happens. So it's like a lot of it just comes from being aware, being educated, being alert on things uh, because they can be hard to spot, especially if it is specific. The good thing about those is that they are not widespread. It takes a lot of work to do that to someone. So encountering it is uh, less likely. It's similar to, did you hear about the, there's a scam that the, it came up maybe about a year ago where if they get enough of someone's voice, a scammer can call someone and say like, hey, I have your mom or your sister here. And if you don't give me money, I'm going to hurt them. And they have their voice, like their AI generated mm -hmm. voice on the back end. Um, that sounds, well, oh, yeah, it sounds scary because it is, yeah. first of all. <laughs> um, but if you know how to combat it, it's a very quick fix. You can contact the person be like, hey, are you okay? Call their phone. You've got your your actual the actual human on the line, and then you know, okay, this person doesn't have them. Yeah, but it's like if you get caught off guard by that, it's terrifying. Yeah, and, and that, that might be really effective because it gets you like I imagine like into the straight panic. Thing we talked about, yeah, and they're then, targeting feelings and, and emotions. Then, yes, yeah, sitting there, it might seem like really logical, right? Oh, just call them and and check yeah. if it's actually you true. You think but that though in the middle? Yeah, of the maybe in the panic. situation, you, you yeah. you'd be surprised how you react. And yeah. the, the good side to that, or the maybe I shouldn't say good, but maybe the relieving side is that that can't just happen to everyone. It can happen to us. My voice is all over this website, so our website. Like you can, there's plenty of footage of me. So I've told my friends that they like, hey, if this ever happens, text me first. I need to be more responsive. I don't respond to people because we're on different timelines. Uh, but I was like, yeah, look, this could happen, and be ready for it if it does. I'm just, I think I'm too paranoid. Maybe that's it. I'm, I just want to cover my bases. That's how <laughs> I feel. But yeah, it's not like they're doing that to every single person. In the world, like it's you can't replicate that on a large, at least yet. You no, can't do it at this point. It, it depends why they might be tra targeting you as well, and yeah. what kind of target you are to them. So th that becomes to. very specific. Uh -huh. But yeah, you, you've got you've got these very broad uh, scope, wide net attacks, basically where mm -hmm. I'm gonna send that email that comes from that looks like it comes from that specific bank, and it's like, well, if you don't bank there, then you're just gonna ignore it, right? But then if you do bank there, you feel like it's targeted to you so now you're more likely now if i know more things about you and i'm specifically targeting you now there's way more things basically i'm able to do so if i know where you work for example then i might um i might get information about your company and now i might call you or send you an email mm -hmm. pretending i'm your boss for example and asking you to do something and then in that moment you're way more likely to, uh, to, to do what I want you to do, basically. Yep. And so I can do that if I've got more information about you and then it gets more specific. So you've got the very broad attacks and you've got the more targeted, I, I think they call it spear phishing attacks. I, yeah, when I was reading about it, I saw that exact phrase. Which yeah. is yeah, more being more specific in what you're doing. Yeah, and I I think then they've got they've got whale whale fishing attacks as well, where that now they're gonna target someone high profile, uh, so like a CEO or something like that, and and sometimes they go wasn't it I think was it earlier this this year they they set up a whole fake meeting with AI generated uh, voices and it, it was basically that long con. And so, yeah. Yes, I did hear about that. Yeah, and yeah. W with with um, they like actually did bring people into meetings and had conversation happening. Yeah, and with AI like that, Using having a AI. sample of of a voice and yeah. being able to train a voice synthesizer like that really you easily. Be vigilant these days, man. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy that that can even happen. Or it's even, only going to get worse. Even grammar checking, or yeah. or I in the way of making websites or grammar look more. Uh, proper and more realistic that uh -huh. that really helps because usually you'd know if you were talking to a scammer back then because I, I don't know usually the English would be like a bit broken yeah, and some, something would feel off mm -hmm. but now AI has that way of sort of standardizing how we might communicate yeah, or large language models <laughs> are a thing now so so now if you're a scammer it's it's way easier to seem legit as well yeah yeah that's uh and I, I mean, most of the a lot of people do know the majority of these things. It's just we're getting into more sophisticated. And especially when you get into crypto, it's like there's a new 
way to think about it and maybe some little adjustments that you need to make. Uh, I think most people just aren't, they don't want to be proactive or no, you never want to take the time to do something before it happens. It's kind of like insurance on something that people don't care before they need it. And then whenever you need like a payout for an insurance, it's like sometimes literally life or death. It's a big deal whenever something goes wrong. Uh, so getting ahead of things, I, I, I call them just the boring subjects, like have a strong password is what people always talk about, but it's not just like have a strong password. Some things that have framed it for me is like when I was listening to, I don't know if it was a cryptographer or just someone who was into cybersecurity, but they said eight characters in a password is basically no password. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's why you get lockout attempts because if they didn't have lockout attempts on a website where you get you know 10 tries or five tries and you're locked, mm -hmm. then they could just put a bot in there and find things instantly. And yeah. people don't do strong passwords. Like coming up with either using a password manager or uh, a certain, I don't know at what point it is secure at this point, using different characters and what the length is. Mm -hmm. But it's like that. There's two-factor authentication. Um, updating your software. And that's these are all things that people don't, I feel like they just don't take it seriously. Like two-factor authentication, I mean, we know what that is. But if anyone else doesn't, it's where you put the little refreshing code on your phone. And every 30 seconds, it refreshes a new code. So you log in, and then you have to enter the code that's only 30 seconds old before it refreshes. Mm -hmm. So they know the person with the two-factor has it in their hand. Yeah, and, and two-factor is good for your bank or for your exchange. So if you've mm -hmm. got like a little money, a uh, little bit of money on your exchange, for example, you want to make sure that it's uh, it's still secure. What you can do is, so 2FA is two-factor authentication. So you've got something you know is your password. Mm -hmm. And you've got uh, something you something you have um, like like your phone that helps you uh, sign off on that on that second check basically. So now you need two things to log in, and if someone has your um, has your password, then they also need your phone with that app that's linked that's been linked to it. So now it's way way harder now mm -hmm. to get into your your account. So you can set that up now with um, most banks exchanges and with your email account and it's always a good idea because now you're not relying solely on your password and then password security is like it's a, it's a big big rabbit hole topic right yeah. because eight characters might be secure enough maybe if it's completely random if it's a mix of characters and special characters yeah but your password can be 15 or 20 characters if you if it comes like from your brain, mm -hmm. it's never going to be very secure because... I've heard that argument recently. Yeah, and, and it, it's it's easy to sort of retro-engineer what people might think is a secure password, basically, because people uh -huh. always think up of the same words or maybe it's going to be longer, maybe it's going to be a few words and they're going to change the E into like a, a three. Phrase. and Yes, it's something like that. And um. so basically your password usually is basically as strong as it is random. So if you want a strong password the most important thing uh, i would say is that it's randomly generated so mm -hmm. that's why it's good to have a password manager because it not only saves the passwords conveniently in a secure place for you also it generates secure passwords on the fly so now these passwords have been securely randomly generated so that they're, they're very very hard to find you actually have to try every combinations yeah. whereas if i know that if your password came from your brain now I'm going to try these things first. Yeah, and yeah. If, even if your password is quite long, I've got a way better chance of, of, of being able to figure it out, basically. It's like the what's your mother's maiden name type stuff where they have those security questions, all stuff related to you somehow. Oh, and the security questions. And I, I think they don't do that um, as much anymore. And mm -hmm. that there was that thing on, 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 on Facebook back then, and it was like these sort of Facebook games that you play and you share. Yes. And it was... I would see was, these posts. What is like, your um, movie actor I'm, I'm pretty sure name? these still happen. Uh -huh. Yeah, like... What is your spirit animal? It's like, what was your childhood dog? Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Stuff like that. And it was... And it was... Uh, <laughs> Lists of... Like, thousands of comments from people. So the, the, the month... Uh, so it, 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 so it, if you if you tell me the um so the the date of your birth basically the day oh. is that word and then the yeah, year yeah. or the month is this and then you, oh i'm called 
this and it's yeah, funny and I'm sharing name. that and now just it, giving your date and, of birth. And, <laughs> and now if I look at that, I know your date of birth and maybe maybe in there uh, there's something like um, yeah maybe maybe there's an answer to one of these recovery questions <laughs> in there. So it's so funny, like as a child of the '90s and the the fear that like my parents and grandparents' generation had of the internet. And how they were like, don't share your information anywhere on the internet. And now people are like, I'm Blue Dancing Cloud. Like, that's yeah. my Facebook name. They're just giving it away, like, everywhere they go. Uh, it's like, it's ironic, but, yes, I mean. That's that's going back on staying secure, right? And and, and yeah. that concept of, like, just, just keeping good privacy. And it's always without, you don't, you don't want to be like too too paranoid or anything but you always have to remember that it, it is the internet everyone's able to uh to look in and so you They're don't want public information yeah you don't you, you don't want to be sharing too much like that about yourself because then there's some like um yes there's some completely edge case maybe maybe you use a security question like that and and maybe you shared some information now someone's able to retro engineer that well let's we we'll probably start wrapping things up we just we're just too conversational. We can talk for ages. Um, one thing I did want to ask uh, before we we close things down is, what is the worst thing that can happen? You know, if someone gets fished or you don't you don't follow security practices and you fall victim to something. How bad can it get, really? Well, it can get as bad as just typing your wallet back up in a fake app and all of your. Mm -hmm. Crypto disappears, and then all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and just you know, it, that's it, the thing if, I want to emphasize. It can literally, as much as you are risking, that is how much it can be. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. If if your uh, wallet backup gets into one of these apps, then your whole wallet will basically be drained. So then it, it's as bad as how much money did you have on there? Really? Yeah, if yeah. if it, if it's your life savings, then it can be quite bad. So. Which I, I thought that that would, I don't know, to me it seems intuitive that that would be enough for people to really take things seriously and, and like I'm going to put mm -hmm. all my money here so I want to know how this works inside and out and make sure there's zero risk. But there have been stories of people typing in their, their private key online and losing like millions of dollars, Yeah, which is crazy to me. Like, yeah, the, the, the big one we see is... Um, you go, you go, you, you you get into this fake app. So maybe you got there from Google or from an email, uh, or yeah, like like a fake website inserted in 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 Google. Uh, sometimes even in the sponsored uh, research uh, results, and then you get into that fake, uh, for example, that fake Trezor app, and and you plug your device, and it says your device isn't recognized, and it looks very legit, and then so you yep. you click next, and it says okay, so we need to, um, the app needs to repair your device or something like that and you need to uh, insert the words and it looks like it, it looks like the trezor app you know and it says that your wallet has something wrong with it you know you unplug it you plug it back you put back the pin code and it just doesn't work and it asks for the wallet backup and you want to access your funds and it looks just like trezor suite so you you, you think you're in that trusted environment so and and maybe in the moment you forget or maybe you didn't know so yeah this is really the most important thing to always remember is the, the wallet backup, the words should never touch um, the keyboard, they should never go into any app or anything yeah. like that. It's just on the on the device itself. If you're trying to right. recover or if you're trying to check your backup, you can type it on the device itself, but it should never go into uh, any sort of computer or app or anything like that. Even if it looks very legit, mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't uh, put yeah, the it The device is the thing you trust. That's another thing we're always yeah. yelling <laughs> about. Yeah, absolutely. But then if, if you do that, if you always remember that, and and to uh, always double check that it, whether you're sending money into your wallet or out of your wallet, always double checking um, that the address on your Trezor device screen matches um, the address you're trying right. to send the coins to and that address is from a trusted source. Um, then if you do those two things, so um, really don't put your uh, wallet back up anywhere, just keep it on between the piece of paper and the hardware wallet itself, and then double check your addresses. If you do that, you'll be safe 100% of times. Yeah. And it, then when you know that, you know that if you receive an email um, that tells you you need to do some update or insert mm -hmm. this or do that, you, you, you just know it's, it's, it's never true. It's always a scam.
Yeah. So last question, uh, whether you've mentioned it or not already, uh, what would you say are the most, as the Trezor expert and what you've seen and what you've come across, what, are the, what would you say are the most common uh, crypto-related scams, either scams or phishing? Yeah, so we, we, we've mentioned a few. There's, um, but address poisoning is yeah. definitely, that. that's definitely up there. And um, th there's been some um, updates um, now in, in, in Trezor Suite for that. So it should basically mask these fake transactions. Mm -hmm. But there's always the risk that one of them managed to get through or, you know, the scammers try to stay on top as yeah. well. So I'd say the most important thing for that, for address poisoning, is always get the address from the trusted source, basically. So if, if it's your exchange, get it directly from the exchange. Um, so that that's a big one. Um, following links and things that yeah. promise you, you know, free money or very high returns. Or it sounds suspicious. Probably follow that gut feeling. Airdrops. Um, but yeah. then there's some more niche sort of sophisticated things. So, for example, a fake Web3 um, website. If you connect your uh, hardware wallet to like a browser, um, like a like a browser wallet, like for example MetaMask, and then that allows you to go on OpenSea for NFTs or on like um, a, um, decentralized exchange websites or or other Web3 DApps or things like that. Mm -hmm. And we've seen some things where a DApp could be real or fake or look like a real thing or be fake or be a complete scam. I mean, sometimes it depends on the crypto projects. So some of them are complete scams anyway, but you had that um, that website that basically sent a transaction to your uh, Trezor device that you had to sign to receive uh, free airdrops, basically, and free free NFTs or whatever. And so when you looked at that transaction on your Trezor device, it, it just looks like it just looks like gibberish, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's like it, that should be a red flag because you, you're a, you're you're about to sign something mm -hmm. on your device, but you're not able to read it. And so for me, you should just stop there basically and contact support just just to make sure yeah. but uh, so if you sign that transaction basically it allows the smart contract to drain your wallet and but people sometimes fall for that because because it's not clear what's happening and and you're being promised basically free airdrops and things like that so that's always the red flag basically someone um, promising you something in return so you've got those um and yeah, and then general uh, trying to make it look like like a real website, basically that that you trust, and and asking you to enter information. And for these fake smart contract, fake crypto website, fake Web three DApps, and things like that, there's um, we like to recommend uh, Rabi Wallet to connect to um, to Web three to connect your Trezor to it because it has. Um, it has more in the way of uh, identifying fake low trust websites, for example, that pop up from nowhere. So now if you're trying to connect to this DAP and you're actually using like a fake URL or something like that, mm -hmm. um, at the moment to do the transaction or to connect to your wallet, Rabi Wallet will say like, hey, there's a red flag here. That website isn't trusted. It doesn't look legit. So it's yeah. kind of like what Google... Uh, what Google Chrome or what's like other browser browsers do to try and keep you out of trouble, identify those fake websites. Rabi Wallet will do that as well um, with with fake basically crypto dApps and things, and it, it will try and raise some red flags like that for dangerous transactions that you might be signing or, or things like that. So that, that 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 can give you an edge as well. Mm -hmm. Well, great. I think that about covers it. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. We do a off microphone handshake. This is our new tradition, and then I come back in and keep talking over here. Thank you, Sean. But yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's great. That's that's it for Trezor Podcast episode number two. I doubt anyone will have listened this far because I think if anyone, anyway, if you're like me, I just hit pause when I start hearing people use this tone of voice, this mm -hmm. cadence. Mm -hmm. I hit pause. I swipe the app away, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm done. I don't even hear this part of the podcast. So that's the end, everyone. Good luck if you made it to the Easter egg. See you later. <laughs>